What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Unlockables podcast, the story of video games, the people who play them, and the memories made along the way. As always, I am your host, Eric, and I appreciate you very much tuning in wherever, whenever in time and space you might be located. It means so much to me that you spend a little bit of your time each and every week here with us. Or maybe it's your first time. I don't know. But you're here now, and that's all that matters. But enough about that. I want to get into my uh, guest today because, yes, I finally have a guest back. I'm finally done doing the solo episodes because I'm feeling a little bit better. Uh, I have with me waiting in the wings uh, the man who will single handedly overthrow Garrick Mock Monastery, leader I of. I have. Uh, I already have. All right. That's what <laughs> I like to hear, sir. Uh, it is, of course, my best boy, good friend of the show, Colby from Switched Up Podcast. Colby, how you doing today, sir? I'm, I'm calling shenanigans on an intro stuff. That was one take. That was flawless. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out so that nobody knows that. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing good, man. I uh, can't, re- can't really complain. Just That's good. You know, en- enjoying the summer, just doing typical m- young 20s summer things, <laughs> working, playing video games, um, doing nothing sometimes, and, you know, just, just taking it one day at a time, enjoy, enjoying life. Can't really complain over here. I right off the bat, I appreciate you making me feel old. The long lost days of summer, man. I would that feels like a different lifetime ago. I would kill to kill to get that back. But that wasn't awesome, my intention. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's OK. It's OK. Um, all, all the boomers over here start podcasts when we uh, during the pandemic. So that's just kind of what it is right <laughs> <It's> now. <true. laughs> yeah, it's true. So um, but before we get started talking about we're going to talk about your show and talk about a little bit about uh, you specifically. I just wanted to ask, and I think I probably know the answer for this, and I'm very excited. Uh, what have you been playing lately? Well, it's funny you ask. Uh, the first time <laughs> we ever linked up for a show was on Pixel Project Ray when we talked about Fireman Three Houses. Yeah, that and now is. the first time we link up on this show, I'm playing Fireman Warriors Three Hopes. Absolutely. Uh, so, that, so when we do another collab in about three, four years, maybe we'll be getting another Fire Emblem Three Houses spinoff or something like that. So looking forward to it already, but. Yeah, today I actually finished the second of the three routes. I finished Golden Wildfire, uh, Claude's oh, nice. route, the Golden Deer. Uh, I right, finished Scarlet Blaze, finished Golden Wildfire. Uh, you know, enjoyed it. Uh, Claude's my favorite character in video games, like ever. I just have such a great attachment to him. Uh, he, I think he, he's a he's a great leader and a, a lot of fun to play as. Just uh, I like the Wyvern Rider with the bow. I think that's badass. Mm-hmm. But yeah, finished that today. Um, a lot of great material they carry over from Three Houses, a lot of interesting story beats and plots. Unfortunately, I don't think all of them are executed in the best way, but <laughs> regardless, I liked it better than Scarlet Blaze, which we've already talked about Scarlet Blaze maybe a little bit too much on our end. But The marathon yeah, uh, episode that was is spectacular, by the way, so definitely I, go I, listen I, to that. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I put, put a lot of hard work into that and a lot of... um. A lot, a lot of Scarlet Blaze talk there, but anyway, um, I <laughs> started, thorough. yeah, I started Azure Gleam today, uh, Dimitri's route, the final route, nice. I, New Game Plus allows me to basically speed run the tutorial, so I just hit plus on everything, skip every cutscene, and just get straight awesome. to the gameplay, so <laughs> I, I have like 20 minutes played and, you know, going through that right now, looking forward to finishing that, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's basically been it on my end, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it back to you, what have you been playing, but I also feel like. I know the answer to this question because my co-host <laughs> is playing the same thing. Yeah, that's no secret. Um, before you toss it to me, I just wanted to ask because, yeah, like you said, we were on that uh, Pixel Project Radio uh, episode about Three Houses, which also plug that one. Go listen to that because that's a great episode too. Uh, Rick and Rick and Ben on hiatus now, but uh, that episode not just because yeah, we're on the it. Heck, Rick, they took a page out yeah. of our book. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, oh, only I, I get. Only we get to quit. That's that's only exactly. we get to quit. But um. Yeah, that was a great episode. Not because just because we were on it, because Rick just put together a great episode in general. But uh, definitely. But I just wanted to ask you because I'm kind of in the same camp you were in regards to three houses. I, I liked as a character Claude the most of the three lords, and I I liked his route the most. I thought it was the most unique between all of them. Uh, without spoiling anything, because I know you're going to have an in depth dive on your show. Um, it, is that kind of what you found so far with the routes you've experienced? Is that it's the premier route, the route you like the most? So far, yeah, I like that route a lot better than Scarlet Blaze. I mm-hmm. think Claude's actually a lot more compelling in this game than he is in Three Houses because you get to a well, you get an in-depth look, and same with Edelgard, of these 19, 20-year-old kids leading their factions for the first time and the entire continent's at war. So you get to see more of like an in-depth at their struggles and you know some of the darker sides. Like We get a darker side of Claude for this game, not levels of Dimitri That's in Three Houses, but 
it's definitely a darker Claude for a couple, good couple chapters there where he, you know, he's a big schemer and he's not, he's not letting anybody and even his allies on what he's up to. And it actually ends up costing him the trust of some of his comrades, not to get too spoilery, but it's interesting. super interesting. Claude himself, so they show you a whole different side of him. Edelgard, I think they do a lot better with her character. Again, still some things here and there that can be uh, tweaked a little bit. Uh, Tyler put it best. I think she's the least likable of the three, which isn't a bad thing. They're all likable, but... You know, as the aggressor of the mm-hmm. war in this game as well, it's the same. Con- it's the same conflict. Um, I think it's easy to be a little bit more turned off by her. But the- nonetheless, I think that their characters and a bunch of other side characters get a lot of well-deserved shine and light in this game. And that's been the most. Um, that's been the most pleasing part of it is that the characters in the world definitely get a lot more in-depth looks. But for a Warriors game, it's definitely surprising. For sure. I think that was the thing I was most excited about. I'm going to pick it up. I'm just playing too many other things right now, unfortunately. But yeah, I think that uh, of everything that Three Houses does great, uh, the cast of characters is definitely a, a strength in making you feel that camaraderie. So uh, that's cool. I always found that Clouds was the most compelling of the Lords, uh, not just in Three Houses, but kind of overall Fire Emblem in general. A lot of the Lords are kind of very stuffy and regal, uh, whereas <laughs> Cla- Claude is a little more l- like laid back. And I, and I like that a lot. And he puts on a laid back like you, like you were definitely. mentioning. Like you, he puts on a laid back face, but he very much has like thoughts and concerns like going on underneath. So just adds an additional dimension to his character character i really like that so um yeah i think i'll definitely definitely pick that one up and i'll be excited to talk to you about it when i do play it uh, is this your is this your first experience with with war, like warriors muso style games no i played age of calamity which we okay we we talked that game to death obviously because it's a breath of the wild spinoff and tyler and i are both breath Absolutely. of the wild fanatics so i uh, played age of calamity so i do have some muso experience it's not my favorite style of combat by any means like it literally mm-hmm. hurts my eyes in cases <laughs> You have to look at so many things at once, and my Y it's ridiculous. My Y button's fading away slowly on my pro controller. <laughs> it's so <laughs> <But> bad. <laughs> it's so bad. Like it is a little like crater in there right now. Just gotta get through one more route, and then it can finally rest. Yeah, I've I'm a longtime fan of the Warriors games. I went, I've been playing them as far back as like Dynasty Warriors on, on like the PlayStation Two. So, uh, which it's the interesting veteran. that that concept. Yeah, it's interesting that that concept translated over, and it was shocking. Like I said, when they decided to do it with Zelda, and even even more so with, with Fire Emblem, but uh, it works. And it's if you need to let off a little steam, it's nothing like mowing down <laughs> hundreds of baddies at the end of the day it's a real power fantasy that's for sure so yeah the game um, will be like you killed 1600 troops that's only <laughs> that's only a that's only a b grade i'm like what the hell <laughs> that's how much more murder do i need for the t- yeah, top it, rank like come on yeah, it's like <laughs> a, a, s rank you have to kill at least 2500 troops I'm like, okay, oh cool. my god that's insane <laughs> i'm like awesome and i have to do it in like less than 10 minutes somehow great that's nuts um well, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to picking that one up. Uh, but like you said, yeah, you hit the nail on the head as far as what I'm playing. Uh, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, that expansion came out. The timing of COVID was really auspicious because I tested positive for COVID the day the expansion came out. And I was like, this sucks, but it's also kind of awesome because uh, when you're my age and working and stuff, you're, you're uninterrupted amounts of time to play games like that uh, don't happen very often. So literally it was over the 4th of July lie weekend and I'm like, I have no, I have an excuse to not go anywhere now. I'm just going to play the shit out of Monster Hunter. So that's what I've been doing. I've gotten through most of, I would say, like the main quest stuff. I'm starting to get into the end game stuff now. So, um, but yeah, I know uh, Tyler, uh, your friend Tyler is a big, oh big God. fan. So I'm, I will, will we get any uh, Monster Hunter talk on, on, the, on the podcast at all? Surprisingly, I put the ball in his court last episode to talk and he's like, no, we need to give the people what they want. We ended up talking for three hours about Fire Emblem. So if we talked about Monster Hunter, that would have been a six hour episode. For sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I've, I, like I've already said, if he's listening to this too, I'm, I'm going to give him a call because I'm planning to I already, uh, do I, I already a planned them. I, I, already, I already prepped them. I said, I asked Eric because he have 12 hours to spare because that's how long <laughs> you're going to be on the phone with him about that game. Gotta That's say, you're, lu- you're lucky your boss doesn't listen to your show, because if he would have found out Monster Hunter Sunbreak came out the same day you got COVID, <laughs> I'm sure you would have got a phone call that day. Nobody knows that I do this show. It's all internet people, so it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a blessing. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, it, it really is. Enjoy I don't it people, while it lasts, because when family I don't need finds people, out it's over, it's time to end it. Exactly. I don't need people <laughs> prying into that. Although I did do a Google search on myself, because a couple other people were like, yeah, if you search your name, like your podcast comes up. So I searched mine, and like it, it's on like the first page of Google, and I'm like, this oh, is no. terrible. It's over. I don't need people seeing this. This is the last episode. <laughs> Yeah, I just I have to cancel and go into hiding now. So, but yeah, Monster Hunter, and then uh, I've always been playing Kingdom Hearts for the show. Everyone knows that I'm for for episode one of Guiding Keys, been been knocking that out, and then uh, 
I've been dabbling back into Civilization VI, that addictive turn-based game uh, that has been destroying. That honestly, the last two days has been destroying my life. I haven't played Monster Hunter, I've played Civ, and is I was that your advanced one. war scratch right now? It, it really is. Yeah, I've been looking for something turn-based. I'll, I have been playing Advance Wars Dual Strike emulated on my laptop. Uh, redact that because I don't want Nintendo to hear that I'm oh, emulating I'm their them. games. Me yeah, it's, your yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, please don't do this. I, I don't know what I would do if me and Moto showed up in my house. I'd probably panic. But um, yeah, yeah I really invite has, him on for an interview. Yeah. That's what you got to do. I wouldn't know what he's saying, but man, that would be wild. Uh, but yeah, that, that really has been my strategic advance wars itch. And I was up till like 1.30 last night playing because I lost track there of time. Go. And That's Civ has one. like, yeah, Civ has that addictive quality where it's just like, oh, I want to do one more turn. Oh, I just need to do this one more thing, one more turn. And then next thing you know, it's 1.30 in the morning. And you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is unfortunate. So, We've all been uh, there. But yeah, that's that's been pretty much what I've been doing. Uh, looking forward to uh, Stray is coming out this week, Cat Game. Definitely going to pick that up. Wife is excited to play Cat Game, of course. So. Oh, well, that, 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 that's, all the, that's all the clearance you need to get a new game. If the wife approves, then you're in. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I was like, well, that's easy. No brainer. So, uh, yeah, that's been pretty much it. So, uh, if you're ready, I'd like to jump into the interview phase of the show and just start asking you questions. Let's do it. Obviously, I wanted to bring you on to talk about your show, so we're just going to dive into it. Uh, you host Switch It Up Podcast, which is a great show about everything Nintendo Switch related, along with uh, sometimes you guys talk about other stuff like, you know, you recently played uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, which that's going to come up later for sure. So uh, I was just wondering, <laughs> what can you kind of tell me about the show's origins? Where did that idea come from? And kind of what the epic origin of, of Colby and Tyler is. I think that's an interesting story. So I, Obviously, the story. Oh, it's a. The story of Switch It Up can't be told without telling the story of Colby and Tyler. I was born June 3rd, 2001, and that's the day I met Tyler. Um, I've known Tyler literally my wow. entire life. My dad and his dad went to Penn State together at the same time. His dad met his wife at Penn State, and then my wife and— Wow. My, not my wife, good grief. His wife and, <laughs> and my mom are best friends. So it, they've been family friends forever. I remember when, I, for the longest time, we would go. He, he's lived in the same place his whole life. I've kind of bounced around. We would we would try to see each other once or twice every summer. That's all the time allowed. Then in 2013, I actually moved to where he's lived his whole life, and I spent nice. eight years there prior to moving to North Carolina last year. So um, it wasn't always like we weren't always the closest when we lived together, just because like in high school, and I hate to use the phrasing, but I was more of like a jock, and he like. Was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was I, I was definitely the athlete guy, you know, didn't try that hard in school, didn't try hard in school, you know, like kind of like naturally popular, even though I hated the term popular and didn't want anything to right. do with that. But Tyler was definitely more of like the, you know, I'm not going to say the word nerd, even though that's the word he'd use to call himself because I have more respect <laughs> for Tyler than that. But he was definitely more into the technology side of things, very studious, like graduated top five in our class, just very, wow, you know, disciplined like that. So... But, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know how the video game thing came up. Just one day, I guess I kind of had... I remember, this is one of the stories I'll tell, because this is the story of video games. This is a good one to lead off with. Nice. Um, my freshman... Around my freshman, sophomore year, before I left for a varsity football camp, which was an overnight three-day camp uh, we did in the summer before the season started, I kind of had, like I guess, like your, an identity crisis, so I got mine out of the way pretty early, <laughs> where um, all I'd played for the last couple of years was... Call of Duty because that's what that's what the quote unquote boys played after school. You put on the 360, you play Call of Duty. It was a lot of fun. The only mm. problem was I was just fucking terrible at it. So eventually, the high of playing with my friends kind of wore off because I just wasn't having a good time. 
And then I didn't play video games for like, you know, maybe a year or two. And then one day I just remember like, just like when you're young, you know how you have like those like waves that just hit you and like those waves of emotion. You're like, I have no idea where this came from. But that's what happened because oh, yeah. I remember when I was younger, I would play like Pokemon and those games on the DS with Tyler. And like I, just, I was telling my mom one day, like it's I just like I like these things, like these Nintendo, like kind of like nerdy stuff. But I'm kind of like afraid to express it because I'm, you know, in high school, you're not supposed to be into that kind of stuff when you're an athlete. You're supposed to be all about, you know, sports and working out and, you know, that kind of stuff. But I always had that soft spot for it. So I remember the day before I left football camp, uh, I came home after practice one day and on my bed was um, a Nintendo DSi that I had won in third grade using a raffle ticket. One raffle ticket. I took a dollar out of my mom's purse without her knowing, bought a raffle wow. ticket, put the ticket into the DSi like bidding and won it in third grade. I hadn't seen it for years, so I saw the DS charging, and next to it was a, a brand new copy of Pokemon Black. Nice. Yeah, so that was kind of like my ticket back in. Tyre and I kind of bonded off of that, and then just kind of went from there. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was kind of the beginning of, that was the rebirth, essentially, of <laughs> Colby's video game journey, but this time I was playing stuff I had a lot of interest in, and then obviously it kind of fizzled out for a little bit then when the Switch got, and then we got to pick the Switch back up. Uh, that's kind of where the podcast started, but mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, to, the Tyler's my, he's my lifelong best friend, so I, I can't think of anybody else I'd rather do it with. And the show itself, to answer the second part of that question, um, the sto- show itself actually started uh, on a Walt Disney World bus in June of 2019. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> because I was, I was leaving Hollywood Studios, and I, I was catching the very end of Nintendo's E3 presentation when they showed Breath of the Wild 2, the sequel to, the Breath, the sequel to Breath of the Wild. Absolutely. And I was texting Tyler just freaking out because I'd played Breath of the Wild. <laughs> and like, we were both freaking out simultaneously, like all caps, like exclamation points, um, a profanity or two. And then we <laughs> just like, we said the one day, like, you know, we should turn these text threads into a conversation. And then I told him, we'll call it, switch it up and we'll hit the ground running. And that's how the show started. <sighs> Ooh, that naming. So good. So good. Uh, first of all, I have, so, I have so, several So thoughts. unoriginal looking back on it. But you know we we've we, we've weeded out the competition. We are now the number one switch it up podcast. That's it. Listen, you, all you gotta do is outlast. That's the key. That's exactly. the key to any venture for sure. Exactly. I, I have several thoughts. First of all, uh, nobody ever wins off of one raffle ticket, so that's amazing. <laughs> like that's I, I, that's I, incredible. I, you know, I told you I got my identity <laughs> crisis out of the way earlier. I also burned all my luck immediately. At the <laughs> this age, is all at of the it. age of eight years old. Yeah. Well, the second thing I was going to tell you is that uh, not to like scare you for future life, but uh, my life's pretty much been a nonstop identity crisis since college. So. <laughs> oh, great. I graduate next year. Can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. No, it'll be fine. Um, but I, I think that's interesting because despite, you know, we do have a, a bit of an age gap between us, but uh, your journey like weirdly parallels mine. I, I was kind of in the same boat as you. Uh, when I was in high school, we were, I was just playing, you're right. Like what the boys were playing. We were playing Halo three, we were playing call of duty and that's like pretty much all we were playing every single night. So I didn't really have, you know, like these, like these big old experiences. Like I miss out on that time, like mass effect. And I missed out on Minecraft and I missed out like all these big things that came out around that time. So, um, I think that's cool how, even though there's a bit of an age gap and generation gap between us, it's, it's kind of similar. So, uh, that's awesome. Um, in your experience doing the podcasts, I, I, you guys have been doing this for what, about three years now, I think? Three years in August. That's, first of all, congratulations. That's that's very impressive. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Is there anything doing the show you've kind of learned about your tastes, uh, gaming tastes in general? Were there any opinions that you had that have kind of like shifted over time? Uh, have you just kind of had any different thoughts about the way you approach gaming since doing the podcast? Yeah, definitely. The one thing I've discovered is that I love games that tell stories and allow for exploration. Uh, Pokemon Black's the most heavy is the most narrative Pokemon game out there. It's the most narrative driven game they have. Yes, it's, it, it's such a. It, I, th- I think it's the best one. It's such so a freaking good. good. It's so freaking good. Like it emotionally hits you, which Pokemon really never really done before. Yeah, but yeah, I love games that tell stories that want to tell stories. You now I we're in an age now where I think games as a whole are like widely accepted as an art. And, you know, people that, you know, put all these hours and effort into telling these stories, I, I, I love, you know, I, I love getting to experience that. You know, the first game we talked about on the show was Fire in Three Houses, which is like the definitive JRPG storytelling experience, given that it takes like 60 hours to beat one of the four yes. routes. So, you know, I, I, I love JRPGs. They're my, they're my bread and butter. They're my go-to. If I 
just because again I, I'm, I'm chasing that story experience like I'm not after the high of you know uh, uh, trying to tr- trying to get a collateral or a bloodthirsty on Call of Duty anymore. I'm after See the your high rank of, just go up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not trying to get my score streak, my UAV inbound. But right. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, ch- I'm chasing the I'm chasing the high of like getting emotionally invested into characters, into worlds, into stories, and that that's that that's what I want now. That's that's what I'm after. Um, funny mm-hmm. enough, an opinion that's changed is that you know I don't have the time to play these long games anymore. Tyler and I forever herald the take of, you know, bang for your buck. If you can get 60 hours out of a 60 hour game, then it'd be considered a good purchase. Problem right. is, I don't really have 60 hours anymore, you know, with <laughs> my, my, my life technically starting next year, which is a crazy thing to think about. But his, too. It's the whole reason we had to put the show on haze to figure out how we're going to keep this alive. But yeah, I'm definitely going to chase shorter experiences, but uh, I, I'll forever have a soft spot for like, especially like IPs that really grab me. And like things that I look at, and I'm like, I think I'd really be into this. That's definitely what I'm gonna mm-hmm. chase first is that storytelling experience. Because I, we talked about, I'm sure we'll get into Final Fantasy VII talk, but FF7 was like the first of its kind that told the sto- told stories on that like cinematic level. And like people got really emotionally invested in that. And then that was kind of the yeah. game where it's like, oh, wait, you can use this platform to express themes and teach people something and that had never really been done before so just getting that experience and you know being introduced to it through pokemon of all games which is definitely interesting <laughs> yeah but, uh, that I, I i got hooked immediately and that's what i was after uh right then and there um a couple other minor opinions that have changed um i thought paper mario the origami king was a good game when we first talked about it i had to walk <laughs> i had to walk that back that that was a bad take that was a bad one I have a I have a personal love hate relationship with Paper Mario because it was the game that ultimately spawned out of Super Mario RPG. Uh, <laughs> so it's like I have so much nostalgia for that game. I'm just look at Paper Mario and I'm just like, you're not what I want. Go away. <laughs> you're, you're the so, inferior younger brother. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I and I agree with you, too. I, I don't think that's a fairly common take in the Pokemon community that or maybe it is that Gen 5 is really good. Um, it would be my favorite if it, I didn't have so much nostalgia for Gen 2. I just. Oh yeah, my rose tinted glasses blind me to all reasons. So it's okay. Um, I understand. Yeah, I, I live. I I share a Discord with a with a brainless Gen Warner. So I've been <laughs> I've been through the ringer with him. That was my childhood, sir. Watch your mouth. <laughs> it's the no. only thing he talks about. I'm like, you know, Gen Five has a pretty good narrative, and he's like, well, yeah, Gen, Gen 5. One had Charizard. And I'm like, I'm gonna kill you through the. Th- that's through the okay. Yeah, Char- <laughs> well, Charizard's overrated, but that's fine. Uh, whoa, whoa, hot take. But anyways, no, it's uh, not. It's pr- it, I, I, I agree with you. I, Blastoise is the best Gen 1 starter, but that's fine. We won't go off on that tangent. <laughs> um, I kind of, yeah, I, I definitely feel you about, you know, these longer experiences. It, it's the time being at a premium is is one of the things that kept me away from like, you know, my good friend Tom, who I did side questing podcast with is uh, famously on the record saying Persona, Persona is like his favorite series and Persona 5 is like the godfather of jrpgs currently and it's like a 120 hour game and i'm like i can't do that i just i cannot it's it's way too much but uh, i'm starting to think that i can because playing three houses again for doing the pixel project radio um the way i was able to kind of like piecemeal it out and play it over time i actually really enjoyed that so now i'm thinking maybe i could do that and that was partly the catalyst too for wanting to do my guiding keys uh series is that you know since i met my wife and my time became more of a premium and adulthood hit me pretty hard. Uh, I hadn't played any Kingdom Hearts game for like three years, which was which was a big deal for me. I normally play at least one once a year. And so uh, I found that I, I can if I want to make the time. It's just it is very difficult these days to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely. And, you know, like I, I'll be honest, um, video games like aren't my number one passion. That's not the thing I look to do in my free time, or like not at least not my number one thing. Listen, uh, video that's games a good are, thing. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, uh, video games are. I call the Switch to the Podcast our passion project. That's because it's it, for me anyway. Doing it with Tyler and the topic we talk about. That's the passion. Video games by yeah. themselves for me aren't necessarily like my number one passion. They're kind of like if I have some extra time here and there, I'll play it. But hardly ever am I making time in my day right. to play a game. Whereas like you've had such brilliant people on this show and they give such and they give such great insight to like their stories and the games they play. When I listen to them, I can tell like they this is what they do. Like this is what mm-hmm. they want to do. They want to learn more about what they what they buy and what they put into their consoles. Like that's never really been me unless it's it's got to be a rarity like where it's a Final Fantasy 7 or a or a Breath of the Wild, something that really 
grabs me with my heartstrings. But yeah, I, I, I think that too, like it not being the number one thing I look to do in my free times also, like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't change it. Like I'm perfectly fine with having video games as like a side thing, but I, that, that, that also affects it for sure. Like I, Persona 5 Royale sounds fantastic. Um, it, if I had, if I had, you said you mentioned three houses, how you playing that bits and pieces, uh, Sir, you'd be halfway through Persona Five Royale. If you, I would be, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of time for sure. Right, and I've at the, I'd be probably through the first fourth of it if I wasn't playing Kingdom Hearts or Monster Hunter. So I mean, yeah, yeah, you're, it's just, you're it's, stretched pretty thin. Yeah, I see why really you had to make that episode yelling at people about gaming announcements, dude. It it was. <laughs> Listen, I yell at people a lot, probably not for the best of reasons all the time, but that's just kind of what I've become known for. But uh, yeah, you're, I mean, you really are right. It just kind of depends on like how you want to like assign your time. And uh, I've chosen to, I, I said that early in the year, I'm like, I'm like looking for shorter experiences, but now the last like three or four games I've played has been three houses. And now I've put in, I'm, I'm closing, I'm going to put in like another hundred hours in a monster hunter. I'm going to play all the kingdom hearts games, which are going to take, you know, between 30 and 50 hours. So yeah, well, I don't, my life is just a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's Listen, I got, I got, I, I hopefully when I'm done with three, with three hopes, I can knock one out of the backlog before Xenoblade Chronicles three. That's my goal. That's here. right. That's, oh man, that's, I was, I was on the fence spot on that one because I, I have a love hate relationship with two, but I just, I think I got to check it out. I mean, I loved one. One is one of my favorite games of all time. I, and I like, missed one. If I'm being honest, I, so. I would. I think it's good. I think it's good enough to play like the definitive edition on yeah. Switch. I think it's that good. It, it's such a great. It's a, such a great story. The voice acting like, it is. Oh my god! But it's Xenoblade voice acting. <laughs> it's it's British people screaming. But um, the story itself, I was really into, it and I like got some really big twists and turns. And from what I've heard, people have played um, three. They said like it's it's an it's really emotional. So that again, like that's back after what that's back when I'm after. So I'm looking forward to you know getting sucked in and crying over these fictional characters that the Xenoblade 3 community is going to stand the hell out of on Twitter. Right, same. That's what I need. If it's going to break my heart, I'm totally in, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, when people come and listen to the show, is there, I guess I know it's just a passion project between you and Tyler, uh, is there anything specifically you want them to take away from listening to an episode? Or like you said, is it just you know something you and Tyler love talking about and you're hoping that they like feed off of your passion or... This is me in real life too. If I can make someone laugh or smile, that that's a success for me. Like if if they laugh, if the biggest thing they took away from that from our three hour episode on Scarlet Blade is they laughed at something I said for three seconds, that's a win for me. That justifies doing the whole thing. Um, I've hit the point I kind of did. where, uh, good. I'm glad that that makes me happy. Like if one person <laughs>, laughs at the episode we release every week, I that's enough to keep me going. Because I've hit the point where three years in, I feel like every indie podcaster has this point where like numbers are like irrelevant i look at who listens mm-hmm. to the show i look at how many episodes it gets like for like this episode's off to one of the best starts we've ever had for an episode but you know it's like it's like okay cool but like pod- podcasting's momentum based is gonna come and go when it with indie podcasts right. only the the big ones are the ones that catch the momentum and never let go of it that's not us we've been doing it for three years it would have happened by now i think but right. You know that so you gotta shift your focus. Uh, my number one priority, my number one, re- my two reasonings are doing it with Tyler and making people laugh and smile. Like I just want to be, I want to be a voice of positivity. I want to be someone who people can turn to when they can turn on the show when they're having a bad day or need something to cheer them up. And if they can turn on our show and have that safe space for a little bit and you know maybe get a laugh or two out of them, a smile or two, that really you know makes them feel feel something good inside that that I'll, I'll do the show forever if that's what it gets out of people there's just too much negativity right now in, in in the world and if i can you know if i can use my small platform with tyler to make people smile and give them a good time while talking while listening to two college seniors talk about uh video games <laughs> that, uh, that's I, I mean it just it makes me happy thinking about it listen i i think that's great i mean you're talking to a guy whose favorite character of all time is sora so i really appreciate the unbridled uh, optimism and we you know especially being in this space too uh in video games and and not just in video games like you said the, the entire world the last four or five years there's been a lot of negativity so um yeah i think just to have these pockets of of positivity is something that is desperately needed uh in, in not only in video games but just in in general and that's inspiring because i i've kind of taking the same route with my show i want you to be able to come and just 
forget for a little while. I mean, I if there are certain things I like to talk about or if there are important things that I think need to be said, like, you know, yelling at the gamers for being an unruly mob <laughs> or the way people get treated or working conditions, uh, you know, I, I think that we should speak up for those things as well. So, um, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's 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 cool. And uh, let me tell you, I definitely uh get all those things when i listen to an episode of the show so uh, good i'm I'm glad i'm glad to hear it and if you're the only one out there then again that's enough reason to (laughs) to keep keep to keep doing it i know i am certainly not the only one but uh yeah and you're just gonna have to put up with me giving you compliments for like an hour so it's gonna be very uncomfortable i i I was on the intergalactic (laughs) pinecast and morgan i caught many turf like the first 10 minutes of the episode and i'm like well there goes like 17 (laughs) there goes 17 percent of the show what else we gonna talk about Shout out to Morgan. Talk about uh, an example of unbridled positivity. Like he is no, certainly he has fantastic. it in spades. Definitely, he's yes. fantastic. But yeah, for sure. Do you have any? Like you said, you've been doing it three years, and I unfortunately I haven't had time to go back and listen to your entire uh, back catalog of episodes because there don't are need a lot to. of them. You don't. Need to. It's okay. <laughs> so you're saying I shouldn't go back to the beginning and start with episode one? If you want to listen to the internal MacBook microphone, go for it. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you don't want to do that, I recommend Oof. starting in season four, where Ty and I figured out how to record our own waves of audio for the first time. <laughs> oh, hey, that's season four. That that's yesterday. So yeah, okay. Um, do you <laughs> have any uh, ex- specific experiences that stand out to you doing the podcast? Like I said, I haven't gone back, and I don't know what you've done over the the th- almost three years you have done <sighs> the show. Now, do you have any specific experiences um, or, or things related to it that just really stick out to you? Uh, there's a couple. I mean, just right off the top, I love doing it with Tyler. Um, if it, there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for him. So doing it, getting to talk to him once a week or however often we get to do it now and doing an episode with him, uh, that's, that's my biggest reason. I, I love doing it with him. It's a way for us to stay connected. Like it, you know, aside from family, Tyler's probably like a top three, top two relationship in my life, honestly. Um, he's that important to me. I love him like he's my brother. Um, you know, like it's, um, it was a way for us to stay connected because the show started in 2019. We were both about to go to college for our freshman years. So not that we weren't going to be not, not, not disconnected, but it was definitely a way for us to stay connected. And it's become an outlet for us to just talk about something we both love. And so doing it with him has been, um, it's been an honor. I'm, I look forward to doing more of it. But anytime I can get him to laugh, like lose it laugh, because he'll, <laughs> he'll chuckle every now and then. Like a couple yeah. times he'll like chuckle when I say something, but if, when I can get him to laugh to the point where like he, when he goes back up to say something but can't get it out because he's laughing too hard, <laughs> that, I I love that. I I love getting that out of him because then it just makes me laugh. But um, I a couple examples of those. So when we do when the Pokemon Scarlet Violet trailer came out, I, I, we do bits occasionally, and they don't they, they go horribly wrong because we never <laughs> script them and we only do them in one take. So I did a I tried to do a Spanish accent to imitate. Uh, the professors from Scarlet and Violet. Oh no! And <laughs> and I and I called um, Spigarito the dank Pokemon in a Spanish accent, and I think he was crying because <laughs> it looked because oh I, I, tr- I tried to connect it to 420 because he was a grass cat, but um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, so he lost it there. Um, I sang a, I played the instrumental of the song Celebration by Cool and the Gang and sang about Mario Party superstars. He laughed at that. And part nice. of that, and part of that bit was I had MC Ballyhoo, the host from Mario Party Nine. I had him, I had him come in and give my two fake um, main characters advice. And when I said MC Ballyhoo's name, he he lost it. But, uh, so we've uh, when we when we talked about Rayquaza fighting Fox and Diddy Kong in Subspace Emissary, that was another one that was pretty funny. Just because of how wild that sentence oh, is to say out loud. That that did happen. I totally forgot. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, Fox and yeah. So after Fox crash lands on Donkey and Diddy Kong's island, a Rayquaza flies out of the lake. Which yeah, is just out of the lake. Wild, but um, uh, an experience that sticks out uh, is um, our Breath of the Wild two theories episode because the first half of it we recorded in person and it actually got cut off because they were throwing me a surprise party before I moved away. So we never really finished it in person, but nice. <laughs> yeah, so we finished. So one half of it's in person, and the other half is scuffed Skype audio. So I'm sure we're both chomping at the bit to get another crack at that one whenever we get more information on that. So that's just a couple. Uh, like you said, there's so many. I, I can't pick one that really stands out above the rest of them. But uh, it just one small victory every week. So I get to do it with Tyler. That's really just the catalyst for the show because you listen to it you know how smart he is how intellectual he is and how like prepared he is when it comes to video games he just knows his stuff yeah and i I feel like sometimes my job is to just get out of his way 
and just like <laughs> just sometimes tee him up. Like if he needs like if he needs me to say something, I'll pitch in. But when he gets going, he really uh, I'll take his knowledge over video games over anybody. For sure, I I agree, and I kind of had a similar uh, experience when I did side questing with with my buddy Tom. Uh, I very much looked at my role on that show was to kind of facilitate. And Tom is such a wealth of of infinite knowledge about anything you can ask him about anything anime games and and he knows he knows his stuff so um that's cool and i think it's it's very important uh i'm gonna go off on a tangent now i'm not like trying to give advice to like the younger kids but uh (laughs) just make sure you hold on to that because yeah it's i've i've found you know growing up if you don't make the effort to to stay in touch and people just kind of drift and life just kind of happens and i've watched my circle friends grow shrink from you know a decent sized handful to just a small number. So um, yeah, anything you can do is an excuse to, and this is just general audience too. anything you can do is an excuse to do a creative outlet with a friend or a person you care about. Very rewarding experience. And it also gives you an excuse to stay in touch, which is very important. I I, I try to reach out to a a handful of friends every couple of months just to check in. So like, like you said, I'm having this outlet with Tyler. It's been like I'm sure, like it's just been it's been crazy that the show that we've been doing the show for this long already. It, it's really wild. That that is wild. Yeah, that's a very long time. Uh, where speaking of how long you've done the show, and I know, like you said, you guys kind of took a, a little bit of a break to kind of reset after season three, coming to season four. Uh, I just want to know, and I always ask this question: What is kind of the future trajectory of, of Switch It Up? What do you think uh, is coming in the future? Do you guys have any kind of ideas, things you're playing with? Things of that nature. I'm I'm looking for the scoop, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you. There's nothing too special, but uh, I feel like the show kind of just got like a second wind. Like this is the first time in a long time that Ty and I both got off of an episode and we're like, this is really good. Like, and we know it's really good, and we know people are gonna like it. And if they don't, they're wrong. Like, kind of like that <laughs> attitude about it. Like we like we both felt really good coming out of the season four debut. So it kind of mm-hmm. feels like the show got like a second wind almost. Cause I, I I don't I don't know if you can hear it in my voice anyway, but like see at the end of season three I just kind of got like burned out, tired, which it happens. Yeah, I mean, we we've been doing the show for like 142 straight weeks. That's it's a lot. It's a, <laughs> That's it's a lot. A lot. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And so and I'll, and we talk about Nintendo, which their least favorite thing to do is tell you about the games they're releasing. So <laughs> tell I, you anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean. As far as the show going forward, we kind of addressed it earlier. Like, it's going to be more infrequent. Like, I, I made the joke that we're trying to release episodes weekly on a day that ends in Y. Uh, just because uh, <laughs> it, it's in, in, in a calendar year from now, like, our, our lives are going to start, basically, and our careers are going to start. And like you said, the time's going to be just uh, exponentially shrunk. So, but uh, the good news is I don't see an end right now. You'd fill, on, fill from deleted saves on, so shout out to him. That was a great episode. And he, like, said... Uh, he he already had the retirement plan in full effect, which I was like, holy <laughs> shit. Like, that's the goal right there. Uh, but I, I don't see an end for the show, which is crazy to think about because we've been doing it for so long already. And also really cool because it gives it means that Ty and I have a lot more to talk about when it comes to Nintendo games and the future of Nintendo and what we think is going to happen and how we feel about it. And I think that, you know, just as small as our voices may be, I feel like sometimes we every ever so rarely we carry some weight so uh, just looking forward to that but i think season four is going to be telling we're gonna try a bunch of new things like i said um maybe some like to to a, a big thing we're gonna do is steal from steal one thing from every show that we listen to so we've are we're already off to a good start there but uh one of those things might be like you you gave me inspiration for the um, final fantasy 7 remake documentary which I don't know if you feel the same way i'm so in my own head about recording by myself it's hell on earth because I nitpick every little breath I take, so I haven't, I, I have an episode done, like fully produced and done. I just haven't released it yet. So one right. day, maybe I'll, maybe I'll drop that, maybe not. But regardless, Tyler and I are definitely branching out to more people to get people on the show. Definitely more collaboration ideas. That's our, that's our focal point right now for this upcoming season. That's great. Yeah, the, uh, steal away from everybody. I mean, take what they do if you like it and make your show better. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge advocate of stealing. Uh, not like actual stealing, but just, you know, creatively borrowing from people, definitely. And um, yeah, uh, like solo podcasting is its own beast. Like I said, I went solo after taking a break from side questing. And sometimes 
after having done a creative outlet for so long, as especially like as long as you guys did. Uh, yeah, it's and really in our space, too, where there's pressure to put out an episode every week. You got to have the episode. You got to have the numbers. You got to try and get the algorithm, all that stuff. Um, I think we need to normalize more. It's like, hey, it's like it's OK to take a break. Like it really is. Or it's OK yeah. to take like uh, a, like just a, a week or a couple weeks. And like that's that's fine. The people will still be here. And, you know, you're not going to just just ruin everything. I think that's that's very very important to do it's something that i do on a regular basis if i'm just like even like sometimes it's in the middle of the month i'll just be like hey there's no episode this week like i'm not I'm, i just can't do it i'm not doing it or i was yeah, too stressed out i didn't i didn't want that didn't line anything up but um yeah solo podcasting is kind of a skill i developed over several years because this is like my fourth podcast i've attempted to do now and uh i did solo episodes throughout the previous three and then i spent a good bit of time in before like the pandemic happened like streaming and talking to myself on Twitch. So I kind of just worked on talking to myself. And uh, yeah, it, that's, it's a very, very weird experience because you're just talking to yourself into a microphone. <laughs> yeah, like, no, it's, I'll, so I'll sometimes, so. it's weird for me because I can go, I can talk, but like when I'm by myself, like I find myself like running out of breath. It's like, I'm so nervous. Like if I fumble once, I'm going to have to hit like the delete section and just go again. Like it's, it, it's hell on earth for me. I, I, I don't know how you do it. I it, I think it's very impressive that solo pod like your your podcast <laughs> sounds so good with guests and like by yourself. Like like when I hear you when I see a forty five minute solo episode, I'm like this would take me four hours to record. <laughs> no, just pretty much you have to just be unapologetic about anything that you say and then uh, clean it up in post. I clean up a lot of the ums and my pauses and weird little stumbles that I have just and just just clean it up. And uh, I'm I'm not a very good speaker. I speak faster than my brain can think and I trip over my words a lot. So that was my uh, big thing too. in um, introduction to speech in college that I just talked really yeah. fast. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, yeah, everyone should take speech in college. I had to take a lot of speech cause I went to business school. So that, that might've helped out a little bit too. Cause like pretty much in business school, like 94% of your assignments are just presentations. It's just like, yeah, oh, you have to do presentations. Like you're just getting ready to go on shark tank and pitch ideas all day or something. <laughs> like that, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's it, um, Mr. Wonderful and Mark Cuban are just sitting there listening to you. Yeah, I'll be like, Mark, I'll take whatever you can give me, man. Just give me season Mavs tickets. That's all I want. That's all <laughs> the only thing I would want. So <laughs> if I can get a um, Luka Doncic well, jersey, that'd be fantastic. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Colby. That's uh, pretty much the end of the questions I had about the show. So I appreciate you sharing with that. Yeah, so of course, man. Uh, we're going to take a brief break for a water drink. And then we're going to dive into talking about you specifically and some games that I'm very excited to talk about. Colby, we're going to switch from talking about the show to talking about everyone's favorite thing to talk about themselves, you specifically. So I just wanted to know, like I said, it's the Unlockables podcast, so it's the story of video games, people who play them, and the memories made along the way. So I just wanted to know a little bit about where your journey with gaming kind of started. You already touched on it a little bit. You said you kind of went away from it for a little bit and when you're doing different stuff in high school. But uh, where did that whole journey kind of, kind of come from and kind of lead you to this moment? It actually begins with my uncle. My uncle is the biggest Zelda fan I know, and I remember vividly watching him play Twilight Princess in 2006 with the Wii and the motion controls and Link's crossbow training, which is the greatest Zelda spinoff ever. I can't believe and that I, was in 2006 already. Uh, it, oh, oh my, my God, God, I know. I, I know. I know. <laughs> that, was, that was 16 years ago, man. I was I was around. Like I, I can now look back then and be like, oh, I was already? Like 16 years ago? Holy shit. But, yeah, yeah, right. Um, 
he's the biggest Zelda fan I know. And like even to this day, like he'll come back up later here in my little background gaming story. But my first memories for me personally of playing a game are Mario Kart Double Dash on the on the GameCube. <laughs> I, I remember. Uh, that's yeah, a good one. That's a great, great introduction. I couldn't have got off to a better start. Um, if I can go back in time, I would I would yell at my mom for putting the GameCube in the family yard sale before we moved from New York and be like, no, we oh, need this. This dude. is going to be this is going to save humanity in the year 2022. And, and, oh. Yeah, I, I miss that thing so much. I look constantly on Mercari about like how much games cubes cost just so I can have one. But I'm afraid I'll get like a block of wood sent to me because you can't trust Mercari sellers. Oh, they're GameCube games specifically during the pandemic and GameCube <sighs> stuff shot up. That, oh, that's, yeah, big that's time. brutal. Like uh, that's my that was my introduction console. So I, I want it. I want it back. Damn it. Um, I, right. <laughs> come right. On, come, on, <laughs> come on. Fate. God whispers from FF7. R. do your thing. But yeah, that's uh, all right. Let's go. Yeah. Come, come on, on guys. Like we, 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 we can't kill you. We're not JRPG heroes, but right. Right. But yeah. Right. Then after that kind of gets a little hazy. Like I have vague memories of playing like soup, like the Wii. It was the next big one, obviously. Uh, my biggest memories from the Wii are Subspace Emissary from Brawl, which I still think is the coolest thing in oh, any Smash Brothers game ever. And it's I, so cool. It's so cool, and I hate that people spoiled it on YouTube, which single-handedly cost Zack Ryder never do another one. I'll never forgive those people. <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember going back and playing that during the pandemic. Like I was like, mm -hmm. I, I went back and played through that. I'm like, this is so freaking cool. It holds up so good. Brawl itself doesn't really hold up great in 2020, but Subspace Emissary definitely does. And then, um, it was the it was the MCU before the MCU. Is uh, yeah, no, great yeah, Nintendo uh, crossover. The, the Russo brothers often say it's their motivation for starting yeah, Iron right. Man. Often <laughs> they're like, we played Sushi Cemetery and we're like, we called Robert Downey Jr. that day and like we need to do. Yeah, this. exactly. But, that was the case. yeah, they, uh, yeah <laughs> as, as they often say in the behind the scenes. But uh, right. but my memory after that's obviously Wii Sports. Everyone played Wii Sports. Uh, everyone was forced to play Wii Sports if you had a Wii. But um, I'm a it's big golf, I'm a big <laughs> golf guy. So my my memories. Um, Spawn of me trying to shoot 10 under through nine holes in Wii Sports Golf, like making it my goal to shoot 10 under par, which I've done a couple of times, and it's a great feeling. But, uh, yeah, a little bit of Super Mario Galaxy 2, uh, some Just Dance with the family, just some random stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, family, everyone played the Wii. The Wii was for gamers and non-gamers. Everyone loved yeah. it. But after that, like I said, it's straight to the 360 COD lobbies, which I think the golden days were Modern Warfare 3. That's my favorite Call of Duty game. I remember playing Ooh. that. I remember um, we we were playing a private lobby three v three, and I um, and I soloed to win. And like I could just remember my friends just screaming in my fifteen dollar <laughs> Turtle Beach headset, like let's go. And I'm Dude, like let's the go. The Turtle Beaches. <laughs> oh my god, I know right. And I, it, it, the peak of my career so early, but right. Yeah. Then it, then we <laughs> then we do Minecraft, which I've always enjoyed Minecraft more than Call of Duty. Um, I, I've had the itch to actually get Minecraft just for one of the consoles, just so I can have it and. Right. You know, turn on my um, turn on my Disney scent waxer, uh, and just play some Minecraft and build a log cabin and just sit there for three hours. Be my version of peace, but right, just vibe to the soundtrack. Exactly, which is right? Like, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah no, turn on peaceful mode. No, no need for stress. But <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Then there's then there was that blip I talked about earlier. Then there was the um, Pokemon White or Pokemon Black, uh, and then you know a little bit here and there, and then um. In 2017, when the Switch came out, I remember we were at a family Christmas in New Jersey, and that same uncle, it's tied all together, bought a Switch and had Breath of the Wild, and I played it for like 30 minutes, and I went to my mom, and I'm like, I, I need this. Like, this is, the yeah. great, this is the greatest thing I've ever played in my life. So, for Christmas that year, I had, I had asked for a 3DS, I remember, but by the time I saw the Switch, like, the 3DS was was like yesterday's like yesterday's coolest thing no longer in but that day i went to the target with my mom traded in th i, I called i called the gm of target and we agreed to a trade of 3ds pokemon moon and a hundred dollar gift card and a first round pick for all the sports yeah, fans out there throw some picks in there yeah, yeah we yeah. threw a pick in there everyone <laughs> loves players they don't have for some reason and then exactly. we um, <laughs> and then and we got the switch which was the hottest console at the time and uh, the mm -hmm. story how I got Breath of the Wild will come a little later, but um, Mario Kart was the first game I got on the Switch, and the Switch has <laughs> just been a godsend, one. and it's my favorite console ever, and it's going to be really hard to dethrone it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like that's that's kind of the journey, honestly. Uh, it's not super exciting, but you know, um, it, it all led to this. It, it kind of had um, like kind of had like a second win there when when I got Pokemon because. For after sure. after getting no scope by my friends in a private match on Nuketown, I'm like, I'm kind of just done with this shit. 
now i'm just gonna i'm just yeah. gonna log off and never come back <laughs> yeah exactly i i i toughed out the call of duty train for a little bit longer uh for for me modern warfare 2 was was peak because that game was just looking back at that game it was just <laughs> so broken but so bananas uh how how just insane those lobbies would get uh you also kind of miss those like pre i, I uh, do too y- the, the lobbies, the, the pregame lobbies where everyone was just like talking. Was like I, would the guy always music to, I would or, always go into private <laughs> chat because I, I was like, I'm super, I was like the super innocent kid who never wanted to swear, but like my, they exactly. would go, they would go in there and raise hell. Like I, I do right. remember, I do, I do miss them going in the game chat and like us talking, them just losing their minds. Like I do, because I never really cared that much. So I never got too invested. I would get mad when I die, but I would never like scream because I always had, right. there's always so many people in my house, but my, my friends, oh my God, like some of the, some of Definitely not my favorite era of gaming, but as far as memories go, like definitely some of my favorites in there. Right. Yeah. And and it's just funny now how none of those multiplayer games nowadays have those like pregame lobbies where you can shit talk people anymore. So <laughs> when, it's kind when, of a when then when Twitter says um kids will never know what's like to grow up in an MW two lobby, they're not kidding. <laughs> the, 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 dude, you you learned things in those lobbies that you didn't know. <laughs> you really yeah. you really did. Yeah, um, definitely. That's did. awesome. Uh, yeah, the uh, Brawl too. I'm so glad you mentioned Brawl because yeah, Subspace Emissary is so so good. One of my proudest gaming moments is we I played it with one of my best friends on the hardest difficulty and we hundred percented it and that was like, I hundred percented it during COVID too. Wow, that's yeah yeah yeah. It's it's it's, um, it's hard to hundred percent that game. I didn't realize how hard that was. Yeah, just to like find everything is absolutely wild. I do have great shame related to Super Smash Brothers Brawl though because uh, at the time I wasn't really like, into like the competitive scene, quote oh, unquote. God. And um, to this day, one of my favorite characters of all time in all of video games is Meta Knight. I think he's just so cool. His design <laughs> is awesome. And so I played okay. Meta Knight and and I, yeah, and I felt like I was so good. And it wasn't until years later that they were like, yeah, like Meta Knight is the only character in all Smash that's in the SS tier and is big this band because uh, he's just too good. It's like and I was it, like, it's, I, it's like I'm it's like Meta Knight from Brawl and like Bayonetta from four. Those are like the two that yeah, everyone's yeah. like, if you played these characters like you are, you're going to burn in hell for eternity. I, I that's gonna be me. I'm, I have great shame, but I, I um, played Marth. I, I love Marth. Marth's my boy. There's the there's the Fire Emblem connection too. That's where right it started there, for sure. That's where it started. I like I like Marth a lot too. Uh, so all right, I'm gonna call an audible a little bit because you mentioned Breath of the Wild, and I've been oh, no. wanting to talk Breath of the Wild shop with you. I just kind of let's do it. You already kind of mentioned it, but uh, just kind of general thoughts uh, on the game or what, what you did. Because a little bit of background about, about my experience with Zelda is that Do it. Uh, I've intermittently played Zelda throughout my entire lifetime. Uh, you know, I didn't play Ocarina of Time until much later. I still haven't played Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword. So my Zelda is very patchy across my entire life. But Breath of the Wild brought me back into being a fan of Zelda, like like hands down. I think I know there's a lot of contention online and people are sick of like hearing that game is great, but it's fantastic. It's, it's one of the best games I've ever played hands down. So that, just so you know where I stand on it. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm, we, I'm glad we're seeing eye to eye here, but I, I guess I'll, you know, the story of video games, uh, I guess I'll tell the Breath of the Wild story. It's, it's I told it a lot because I've been for some reason I've been on a lot of podcasts recently and we talk about Breath of the you Wild. You have been. Almost, I, I'm a busy guy. <laughs> But um, yeah, Breath of the Wild. To put it shortly, uh, Breath of the Wild is really special to me because that same year, 2017, that same that same Christmas, um, my grandparents had recently gotten divorced, uh, unfortunately. But uh, my grand, but because but because of it, my grandfather was able to come out for Christmas, which is which a rarity. Like we hardly ever saw him, so for him to come out Christmas was very special. And it was the first year he had ever bought gifts for us, like because he'd never done the gift. He'd never done the gift buying, and he let us all pick one thing, and I—that's the game I wanted. So, wow. he bought me Breath of the Wild. I went home, put it on my TV in the guest room. The thing I'll always remember with that game when I first got it is like how everyone in the room was like, "Look, paying attention," because I was in the room right. with my grandfather, my dad was in his 40s, my mom who was in her late 30s at the time, my younger siblings, but like everyone was looking at the TV, like what is this like right even if they never really cared about it like for that split second had everyone's attention which is a rarity like in a house of you know i live with six people like it's it's a rarity that at one time everybody everybody's eyes are on the same thing which for me that was really special but when that title card hit i'm like yeah this is the greatest game of all time like no doubt about it this is my favorite (laughs) game um i refuse to believe there's anything made that is better than this but yeah uh, i god breath of the wild um I, I I don't I can't even like sum it up in the words like without just rambling. Right. But to take a word out, take a page out of Tyler's book. Um, it's the 
that that game I I cried multiple times during that game uh, just to get like set really serious um like because I, I just couldn't believe like when I was younger I had like this notion and this is pro this probably developed like because I only ever played Call of Duty but like I had this notion that like the for some reason like only really good gamers play Zelda because I've heard it's like this dungeons mm. and you, you have to find these items that only work on certain things and I'm like I don't think I'm that smart to figure it out but. Right. Like, I always, I, I, and being around my uncle who loves Zelda, like, I'd always thought of Zelda always had this, like, sacred place, like, in my mind when it came to video games. I'm like, I don't think I'll be able to, able to touch that because it's so meaningful to people. But, I mean, when I got my hands on Breath of the Wild, it was, it was life, it literally life changing. Like, I, the sense of expiration that game gave me, the high that game gave me, um, it was my only game for a long time, thankfully. I, 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 I wouldn't have played anything else. You could have given me the whole Switch library at one time that Christmas, and I would have only played Breath of the Wild. I'm pretty <laughs> confident. But, I, yeah, uh, when I got to Zora's Domain, I cried. That's my favorite place in the entire game, Zora's Domain. Gorgeous. It, Beautiful. I, I almost prefer it when the rain, when, when it's raining. Like, I, I love yeah. it there when it's raining. It's The music's incredible. Um, uh, places that smell terrible. Rito Village, I think, is up there. Just because of all the bird people. <laughs> that place has to smell awful. Uh, to tie that yeah, to, a, I, I to a question you got last week, but, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, that that place has to reek. Holy shit. Um, yeah. But I cried. I cried when um the memory of Zelda crying played. Uh, despair. Yeah. Memory, memory sixteen. That was in the, that was heavily like shown in the trailer. But and, and yeah, for some reason everyone got mad. They're like, oh, this isn't a memory. It's not actually part of the story. I'm like, oh, like, dude, this is like a really emotional game right now. Like it. It, really it is a part works. of the story. Just because it's a memory doesn't make I it part agree. of the story. When, like, what are you Zelda, talking about? Yeah, uh, when Zelda <laughs> you don't said, get to see it. You don't get to experience it like happen in game, but like yeah, it like, that's a, that was big. Like that was a yeah. big moment for the franchise. And um, when, Zelda, when Zelda said, "Courage be not be remembered for is never forgotten," that is that that was an incredible line there. That that got yeah. me choked up. And then when I finally beat the game, I just remember like crying. And my mom walked in. She's like, "Why are you crying?" I'm like, "I'm just like so happy as the credits were playing. Like, just because like the game was everything I'd ever wanted it to be and more. And just like it's such a meaningful experience to me. Not just because of how yeah. I got came across it, but you know when you get into that Hyrule and you just explore and it's the soft melancholy music and you're yeah. just you you're you're just not like it's like when Doctor Strange is and like in, when he leaves his physical body. That's how I felt playing it. Like I just felt like I wasn't all the troubles I had been dealing with and like, you know, there was stuff going on at the time and there's stuff going on with me now where like I could use that escape. So, you know, maybe it's something I'll fall back on. Yeah. It's always something I can do and fall back on. But yeah, that God, that game's so important to me. It, it's literally mm -hmm. the only game I'll ever say is like perfect. And it, it's my favorite game ever. I really don't think anything can beat it. I, I really don't just because of how much meaning it has to me. Yeah, listen, this, I think we need to definitely normalize crying during video games because they are very emotional. I mean, when Kingdom Hearts 3 ended, I, I probably cried for like 30 minutes throughout the entire end credits. So um, <laughs> they can have very powerful emotions. Yeah, Breath of the Wild brought me into the franchise that I just didn't me feel too. Like that was, was my first Zelda game. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page you were. I just I felt like there's a certain prestige to it that I didn't. I just didn't feel like I, sh I should play them. Uh and it brought me back into the franchise in a way that now I'm more open to going back and playing more of those Zelda games. Although I'm I'm afraid of what I'll find when I do go back because uh, I, I haven't played a lot of them, but I have seen so many of them played, and I've watched videos and video essays on all the different Zeldas and stuff like this. And uh, to me, Breath of the Wild represents Zelda in its purest form. It was what Miyamoto originally intended the series to be when he first created it. He, I mean, when he created yeah. Zelda, he said that he got the idea from exploring caves near his house when he was a kid. And that's very much how the first Zelda was. It was just, you're in this world, go explore, do anything in any order you want. It's very unstructured. And then once you get into like the later Zelda titles, it's very, it's a little more structured. Like it's telling you a specific story. It's telling you why you need to go places. And Breath of the Wild really just unchained you and said, we're not going to do that anymore. He's like, here are specific story beats if you want to follow them. But just just go go where, go wherever you want to do and i think if you're talking when you're talking about the spirit of the legend of zelda that is the spirit of the legend of zelda i i, tr I truly truly believe that not to like knock any of the other games that came before it is you know especially the people talk how great ocarina of time is and i'm not going to take that away from it it is a great game um 
but I think hot take Breath of the Wild is is just when it comes to the spirit of Zelda is everything that Zelda is supposed to be hands down. It's it's a beautiful game. Yeah. And I remember reading like when um, Breath of the Wild was made that Miyamoto was like, yeah, we wanted to go back to Zelda 2 and like that openness and that freedom to explore that they just couldn't convey on the technology at the time because it was 2D sprites. But now it's like. Like I imagine, I imagine Miyamoto and them are like happy that they've lived long enough and been doing long enough to like see that realized, because it's it, it Breath of the Wild. Like we talked about it, like Breath of the Wild is one of those games where it's like there was a before Breath of the Wild and there was an after Breath of the Wild. It's one of those landmarks in games that it kind of changed everything. It definitely changed how the open world. Everyone's doing an open world game now, which is. You know, I'm not saying Breath of the Wild is the first to do it. Uh, it wasn't even the first of its generation. I would give that to Witcher 3, just in terms of how, like, Witcher 3 was so huge and expansive with its story and characters and exploration. But it's just something different with Breath of the Wild. Like, I I love it so much, yet I can't put my finger on it at the same time. But it's, yeah, like, I think it's super special to me. It's super special to you. It's super special to a lot of people just because of that sense of freedom and exploration. And, you know, l- literally anything you try to do in that game works which is incredible. It really is. So that that's really cool. Like you watch speedrunners and you're like <laughs> literally anything you try to do in this game will work. And any, any and everything you attempt to do is going to work. So it's one of the few games I think that you can actually say that about. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I can talk forever and ever about it, but I'll I'll cut myself <laughs> off here to avoid any further um you know, unnecessary spe- spewing. <laughs> I love I love the spewing. So um the other one I wanted to talk to you about uh, since I'm, we're basically answering my questions talking about the, the games that you play is um, specific. Yeah, I only play two. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I so do I. Final Fantasy IX and Kingdom Hearts, that's the only games I play. So yep. I, I'm right there with you. That's it. Um, that's it. I wanted to ask you about Final Fantasy VII specifically uh, and just kind of what you're, it, because that's, that was a game that came out when I was, when I was little. The, and, you know, the original Final Fantasy VII and, you know, the original Final Fantasy IX alongside Super Mario RPG got me into liking RPGs. Uh, and I, I hit Final Fantasy VII a little bit later in my life. But um, how did you, how did you come across, across that game? And what was, what was playing, did, did you play the original first? Or did you play the remake I played it first? twice. I played it twice. The original? I played the original twice. Wow. Okay. So, uh. That started actually with with Jeff Keeley and his um winter pool party at the Game Awards. Ah uh, yes, Sephiroth. <laughs> when Sephiroth, I, I love just to go. I loved that fucking joke. The Jeff Keeley's summer pool the party. Summer pool party was so. <laughs> that, I was la- I, That made me laugh all day. Like I think Keith said it, and you, I heard you say it, and it was. I could not stop laughing. But yeah. I, I, anyway, I, I yeah, inadvertently I, stole it from video game donkey too. He said it as well. So it, it was. <laughs> it was. I'm laughing now thinking about it. Like it's just so funny because hey, that's exactly what it was. Jeff Keeley's summer party. summer pool party. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Keeley summer pool party. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, yeah, name the episode that. Um, Colby and Eric summer pool party for but, sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. Good God. Um. So. When Jeff was up there and like everyone's here, at least I thought, and Sephiroth got announced, I'm like, that's the coolest motherfucker I've ever seen in my life. I have no idea who he is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, that is the coolest character I've ever seen in my life. I have zero idea who he is. And that's kind of where it started. And that was then, first Smash, right? Yeah, first I knew Smash, who Cloud yeah. was. I knew like my only experience with Final Fantasy was I knew who Cloud was, and I somehow knew of the big FF seven spoiler. Like that happens at the end of disc one. Oh, um, I don't know if we should cover up the. Not, it's twenty five years old at this point. Yeah, so, that that's very much in like in the zeitgeist. So yeah, even before I played Final Fantasy seven, I I knew that spoiler too. So that's just yeah, that's like, like video. That's like if you were to take an introduction to video games, like that's in the first lesson. Oh yeah, Aerith dies in the original. <laughs> this is so, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's like this is um the two biggest moments in gaming. We have Pong and Aerith dying in the original FF seven. Like, right, those are the number one and two <laughs> in that order. But um. Yeah, there's an important guy named after. Mario in between there, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't there. die, though. No, like, he, no, he like, didn't die. We, we don't feel bad for people who don't die in video games. Yeah, Come on now. You're but, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember like rec- I, I went straight to YouTube and I'm like, who the fuck is that? But and then everyone's like saying like Sephiroth, like Tyler even knew who he was. And I kind of th- and like looking back, on him, I'm kind of like offended that he knew who that guy was. And I didn't. Right. Like knowing how much I know now. But. I, then I, I watched the Rad Brad play through it, and I remember mm. I, I watched his entire playthrough, and like it, it and like he talked about how the original was so special because he played it when he was a kid, and FF7 Remake was the first game he was playing since he became a father. And I'm like, 
that's really freaking cool that a you had that connection and b it came full circle like yeah that. so i watched that and then i'm like you know that was pretty good but i still don't know a lot about this and then i came across maximilian dude one day oh, very God. popular i love youtuber him. for he fought for he's a big fighting game guy but he is like literally the Final Fantasy VII Godfather. He knows everything somehow about that property, and he knows everything that's to come. He pred- he predicts everything, and he like went deep dive with this lore and like yeah. the themes and the characters and like what this all means. And I'm like, good grief! Like this is a huge fandom. So right then and there, I started the mission to will this game into my existence. <laughs> I and in doing so, I played the original on my Ninten- on the Nintendo Switch in 2021. I bought it. Wow. Um, a day, uh, yeah, so I, I bought it, and I remember, I freaking loved it. I'm like, this holds up so well in 2021. Like, yeah. I love turn-based, so that was a big win for me. Uh, I, you know, obviously the polygons moving around was a little bit <laughs> different than I'm used to, but um, I, I still loved it. Like, I freaking loved the original FF7. That game made me cry, too. I didn't cry when Eric got harpooned, but at the very end, um, <laughs> at the very end when, um, you know, like, you don't know if you've saved the world or not. Right. Like it's very, very open-ended, which I thought was incredible storytelling. But the the three, like, notes, like, the... Dan, 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 and then Aerith's face comes at the very end. I'm like, God damn it. Like, I'm going to cry. Like, yeah. uh, all of humanity could have just been wiped out. But, you know, like, that... The way that game gets you attached to its characters... I, remember, I was watching a YouTube video on it, and these guys were like, wait, why the fuck do I care about this, like, a, a dog, a flower girl, a guy with a gun for an arm? Right. Or, like a like a, a psychotic swordsman and just this this Tifa the most normal of them right funny enough but <laughs> yeah and her story is like she's been like slashed in half by Masamune and has no idea who Cloud is like she's the most normal somehow but like why do I care and I'm like I, I ask myself too I'm like why do I care about these guys but they're all freaking awesome so mm-hmm. I remember I played I played that twice like I remember loving it like I thank thank God for times three mode because I just basically sp- sped ran it oh yeah but but then um. I got, then I collected the, in part of willing this into my life, I collected the Amiibos. I got the original Cloud Amiibo, and then, graciously enough, Alex from a random gamer's corner, he sent me the Player 2 Cloud Amiibo as a gift. Oh, cool. Which I thought was super, which was super freaking cool. So, I had both of those, and then I got, like, wall art, stuff like that, but <laughs> Black Friday of last year comes, and I actually bought Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrated on Black Friday for thirty dollars on the PS5. I didn't get a PS5 till April of this year. Wow. So I made a down payment, as Tyler likes to call it, <laughs> to ensure that I would eventually play this game. And funny enough, I walked into my local GameStop one day just to check because I like to go in every now and then. Yeah. And I know GameStop's not the hottest place right now, but I do like to buy my <laughs> games from there because the people that buy the people that sell you the games, they like care. They're not the problem. But um it's not their fault their uh, corporate overlords are yeah. terrible people. Yeah, like the CFO just got like fired. Like there's uh, something's always happening there, but uh, it's not it's not the those people actually care about the video games. So I, I like talking to them. But yeah, the walk I walk in, they're like, Yeah, our PS5, we still have our PS5 sale going on. I was like, What the fuck? Like, is this like what 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 do you the, the the gates of heaven just That's opened. amazing. So yeah, I just I drove home. I'd been saving money for three years and I grabbed my entire savings. And bought a PS5 Dude. and played remake two days later. That's and amazing that I I have yet to see one in the wild. So that's that's very impressive that you just happened to like stumble across one. That's man, talk about putting it out in the universe. That's we've had two. We've had two since then. So if Venmo me some money. I guess they have a connection or wow. something, and I'll get you one and my, send it out to my Green wife. Bay. My I'm wife. Uh, regret, I, I am not. No, I'm not in that terrible state of Wisconsin. I, no, please never say not that again. Worse uh my bad no offense to anybody that lives in wisconsin i'm just a lifelong bears fan and fuck green bay packers uh sorry anyways um, <laughs> there it is yeah sorry going going back on topic um my wife actually got mine on a on a, on a pre-order that she had to pick up from a store because i, I told her I, oh shout out her yeah dude i fucking love her so much she went above and beyond to secure one because i she i don't like to like ask for things for my birthday because i'm just like i'm like an older guy now i'm like you don't have to get me anything for my birthday i just want to like go out and have food and like have a good time or whatever like that's the one day a year i get to go out and like have fun right but i just i'm gonna cry i got older for 10 minutes and we can go like have a drink or something <laughs> but i just on the offhand i just mentioned i was just like oh i want like a ps5 for my birthday just like offhanded comment and she like set up twitter accounts for like follow all the tracking twitter accounts for like that's when insane. when they're restocking and like send up for like email alerts and, like all this stuff and there were she 
told me the story. She there were like four separate times that she like had one in her cart, but she like couldn't finish the order and she didn't get it. Like a I'm, bot beater. Yeah, yeah. And and like the fifth time, like she she got it. And I was just like, I love you so much. This is great. Well, you know, she's playing the long game. She has to take like the next four birthdays off now. Yeah, that's why I told her I'm like, you don't have to get me anything else ever. Like this is yeah, I, no, she, I'm she's content. good. <laughs> you you have you've made me happy. <laughs> No, yeah, I, that, not that she don't make me happy. Like I love you, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, yeah, she, you've done enough. Like yeah. your 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 life's mission in this um relationship has been, has concluded. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the that's the last game that made me cry too. Um, was FF Seven. I didn't cry. I got teary eyed when Cloud jumped off the train. The title card played. I'm like, God damn it! Like I'm finally playing this game. Yeah, that was. Uh, I played it probably about a decade ago. Um, like in my late teens early 20s maybe so there's it was before and it was before the remake was even announced or, or before i even kind of knew how they had like that tech demo on the ps3 and all that stuff uh so wild times coming off the high of that e3 seeing kingdom hearts 3 for the first time uh which i was just absolutely just losing my mind uh then they show just that beautiful cinematic trailer of yeah like you said like, just of of midgar and like at the end you hear those three notes and it's just cloud and bear like walking through people and i was just like i was stunned i'm like it's i so can't good. yeah i couldn't believe what i was looking at and even like getting to play it in not not having like the strongest emotional not as strong a uh, connection to seven as i do to like nine or, or some other games but yeah. I just when I fired it up and yeah, you played like that bombing run sequence and like it starts off and you jump off the train and like I just I pause for a second. I'm like I like I genuinely can't believe like what I'm holding in my hands right now. Like I can't believe that this exists and I can't believe that this is like something that they yeah, they have, did is is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Like I that I could never put myself that would be like if Breath of the Wild got remade in like twenty years for me. Like <laughs> that it be doesn't need panic. to be it, it's it's too <laughs> modernized, but like if for some reason if they decided to make Breath of the Wild, like that would be me. I would I would like be like, what? How is this happening? But I can't imagine like growing up with a game like that and then seeing it remade all these years later. Like that has to be like the most full circle it comes for a video gamer. If they did nine, I would I would feel much stronger. They're gonna do nine. That the Nvidia leak has been 100 percent accurate so far. So and Final Fantasy Nine remake. You talk is, about it. You only talk about it like once an episode. So I, I'm, I'm very aware. <laughs> I'm putting it out there in the universe that I would love to love to see. Yeah, it. You just gotta you just will it in your life. That, yeah. That's how that's what I did. You it was, just gotta will it into existence. It, it's a it's a gotta relic watch of that a Netflix kids show first. Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend like I didn't hear that. But uh, Nine is very <laughs> special because Nine Nine is like the last of like the pre Nomura age of of square enix of final <laughs> fantasies so it's kind of like the last bastion of hope before he just takes over and shit just starts going insane which obviously i think he's on his way out now though because he's really passing off the reins here for the remake stuff he's so, diving like, into King- says he's diving you. into kingdom hearts 4 like he's exclusively focusing all of his effort on that and he's turning it into like this he's your he, he's your issue he's your problem now. he's combining it with his he, weird he put, like he put a heartless as the final boss in ff7 r and he's like my work here is done <laughs> And he threw in the ghosts and the time travel stuff. So that's yeah, he 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 did what he had to. Um, yeah, he, he was like, I, I my he's like Hamaguchi. It's yours now. I've done everything I can do. Here. Exactly. I have to go work on my on my other pet project where I'm trying to square away Disney properties with a long canceled Final Fantasy versus 13 game that turned into 15 but not really and whatever the history is there so yeah that'll be fun to now talk about excuse on the show, me i sure. have size 19 shoes to draw <laughs> hey he's got regular size shoes now in the new trailer so well i don't like well, it no it's i need the well it shows him barefoot it shows him barefoot so it's it proof that he has regular size feet keith is gonna love this that we're talking about feet on the show he's just gonna absolutely eat this up but um well, when you talk about story you can't you can't help but talk yeah. about it so it's just like with. he has regular feet but just those giant ass fucking shoes like it can't be like i've tried to run in big shoes before it's not fun so it's not fun at all so bob Iger was like mickey cannot be called mickey mouse and sora <laughs> needs three sizes too big on his shoes then you can have gone you can have don and goofy under those two conditions right and they're like done it has to look good when we raise walt disney from his cryogenically frozen sleep so can you imagine frozen walt disney presenting that game at e3 2024 <laughs> uh no because wasn't he anti sem wasn't he an anti-semite i think he was man we're getting in the deep in the rabbit hole now so <laughs> um but yeah really so i just wanted to ask briefly uh here before because my experience playing seven and then the remake was is a little bit different just because i had some time to gesture on it so what was your experience like playing 
like Final Fantasy VII, like you said, in 2021, and then pretty much getting to play the remake like the next year. What was what was like? How did you feel about that? Uh, I think that obviously you can't really say one's better than the other because I guess the remake trilogy isn't done yet. But right, I, I found myself a lot more connected to original seven than I did remake. Uh, I think remake does a great job of expanding on the ideas of the original game. And I think it gives you some great extra content. Like wall market is insane. Oh, like, it's that so is, good. That, that's a, it's, it's insanity. Like even like the, like I, I just spend like, I, I just spend time running around like the sector seven slums at night. Like I just, I live for that stuff yeah. and like the sector five slums and you know, uh, but there, there's a lot of filler in that game, uh, admittedly. Like, going back to the sewers, like, the drum at the very end of the game. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there that, you know, didn't really tickle my fancy. I'm kinda, I was kind of ready to get done done and over with. But the stuff that does stick out, like, the revamped Air, Air Buster fight, the Colosseum, yeah. the, uh, all that stuff really sticks out to me personally. But, like, Original 7, that's just... um. Good God, that's just a landmark in gaming. That, that So, just being able to experience that albeit 24 23 years later right uh it 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 it, it really gave me perspective and i'm really glad i played it because uh you you had you if you don't have any knowledge of og7 there's gonna be some stuff in remake that you don't understand until this is over right which is gonna be like that's insane to think about but yeah now it gave me a perspective for sure i'm very appreciative of the for the original and it might be a game where i try to revisit it every couple of years uh just because it's not gonna get it it's done like i don't think it's gonna age any worse than it already has like i think it holds up pretty good like i i like everything about it um but yeah seven remake is just that's the game i've been looking that was the most anticipated game forever so uh, that's obviously the game i'm gonna you know lean towards when right. picking between the two just because it's newer I, the combat's so freaking good and just the there's there's more there's more like you get to see more of the characters like just even more of them like because like in Midgar Midgar's only like six hours this one's like 40 yeah so it's just so much more stuff to do and so much more world to explore and so many more things to see so that that's that's the game I'm gonna pick between the two like I just got done playing um the Jesse Biggs and Wedge chapter on hard mode oh yeah yeah like that that's that's such a good chapter because like when they when they die in the original you don't really care but like no jesse has like three lines they, of dialogue in the original that's it like you don't know her at all yeah i know and and now they get like this they get a whole chapter dedicated to him and you're like this is freaking awesome yeah like this is this isn't filler like this is actually like good content and you get to learn about her dad and then you get to go to the annex and they get all these cool little moments so ff7 has a lot more of that which is why i lean f7r excuse me has a lot more of that and I, i'm a i'm a big lore junkie so i i ate all that up like a pig in the slop but yeah, that, that's the game I'm going to lean to just because of, you know, the meaning it has to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most anticipated game now, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, hopefully coming end of next year. That would be sweet if it did. But yeah, and I, I'm glad you have that appreciation because nowadays, especially like when you do have conversations, a lot of the conversation is like, oh, well, that's an old game and old games aren't really that good. And people don't people don't tend to give them the the light of day just because, you know, we, we really looking back on where we've come from and how far we've come. Uh, we're very spoiled in what we have today in, in the terms of the quality of the games and, and just the, the choices and oh, the yeah. accessibility to them uh, that, you know, if you got Final Fantasy 7 back in the 90s, like that was the one game a year you got, you were going to play it for 600 hours. Like that's just how it was. But I'm, I'm glad you you have that. And I think we definitely need more of that in, in just video game discussions as a whole is like, OK, yes, like this game is old and it's outdated and like the practices now are obviously not best practices but at the time like this game is very important like it's it's very important for how far we've come for the direction it took the industry and like i said seven isn't my personal favorite but i respect the hell out of it for what it was i just i mean we're talking about cultural forces of the 90s it was certainly one of them and it still to this day is the most successful of all the final it's yeah i mean as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's its own thing. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's detached from the mainline Final Fantasy and it's, its own line of, of like games and stuff now. Like it's it's completely created its own identity for itself, which is which is incredible. So, um, man, now I'm gonna have to go back and play OG Seven again this year because I got the itch. That's great. Um, <laughs> it's really freaking good. It's yeah, really freaking it good. is.
Okay, Colby, I kind of arrived at the end of the natural part of the interview. So, and uh, we've hit almost my hour and a half ceiling that I kind of keep for the episodes. Uh, so I want to give you this time at the end of the show. I kind of just say, shill all the things you want to shill. If you want to <laughs> tell everyone your socials, if you have something you want to try and sell, uh, that's perfectly fine. You can use this space to do whatever that you wish to do with. All right. Um, uh, I... <laughs> I guess shilling a, a, at Colby underscore more on Instagram and Twitter. Although I, I think I'm nearing a Twitter retirement <laughs> and it's for the better because Twitter is just a, is such a bad it's place. It's a wasteland. <laughs> now, I, 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 I interacted with one Aerith stand and I'm like, I'm done here. But <laughs> so I, I might retire there, but uh, go, more importantly, go pay attention to the podcast. That's what up pod on Twitter. Um, Apple podcast, Spotify, wherever you're streaming and listening. Like we just said, season four just came out. If you, have a fire emblem fancy that you want scratch uh plenty of content there for you for three hours worth so uh very proud of that episode if you if you enjoy it please let us know but uh, yeah i don't really have a as you say here a patreon never discord never snake oil not really um <laughs> so yeah that's that's kind of really it uh i keep a low profile for the better sometimes you have to it's the the grind of social media is exhausting so that's definitely a good strategy to take uh yeah all those socials will be linked in the description of the episode if you if you want to click and follow you definitely should uh go check out switch it up podcast season four very great if there's nowhere better to go if you want uh modern fire emblem content it's it's been fantastic i i'm pretty well versed in the old fire emblem games but uh the modern stuff i don't know as well so uh, keeping me informed doing the lord's work i really appreciate that and uh as far as my show unlockables podcast you found us you're here congratulations appreciate it uh, all my stick socials around. yeah stick around all my socials are also linked in the description of the episode and uh for switch it up and unlockables uh if you find yourself apple spotify all those ones leave a like uh rating or review whatever this the system is for reviews uh, helps us out for sure and gives the show more visibility uh or if you just you know if you hate it want to leave a one star uh, i eat that shit up so leave me a one star review and i'll i'll fight you um <laughs> not to like threaten people <laughs> we only we've them. only ever gotten five stars so i'm waiting for the one star nice. i'm gonna celebrate that <laughs> nice yeah that's when you know you've really made it that you're really hitting hitting a nerve with people for sure but um yeah when people don't like what you do that means you've made it exactly exactly but uh again colby thank you so much for for coming on man i appreciate you giving me some of your time tonight it was awesome talking with you for sure and um there will definitely be opportunities in the future where i definitely know i want to talk to tyler about monster hunter uh once i start doing some more fire emblem stuff and some other ideas i have for my channel uh definitely gonna have you guys on for sure to do that some of that stuff too so uh i'm looking i'm looking forward to it man thanks so much for having me like um this this is like this is like a indie bucket list kind of thing for me, <laughs> oh, being on the show. Like I, I I think I think really I no seriously I think really highly of the show. I think really highly of uh, everyone in our community. Like um so this is this has been really special. Like getting like getting the call, getting the Discord message. Like it was it made my day. So hopefully hopefully I hopefully I gave you the best podcast episode ever. If not, we'll have to try again. But um yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It was one of the best hands down and uh, i don't think compliments oh, well so uh top like what 15 that you've had so uh we'll this will be it. episode 19 so yeah the top or this will be 20 total episodes or like 20 something oh so, so top 20 i'll take yeah it. yeah easily easily for sure um but Just slot one throw a dart between one and 20 <laughs> i'll be happy uh it, it'll definitely be uh the most well-produced one until the next one because i try to get better every time so <laughs> but, uh, um, it, listen if i if i get to wear that crown for a week i'll i'll, I'll wear it probably <laughs> for sure for sure uh again i appreciate it and uh your kind words uh, i'm not good at taking compliments so i'm just gonna hang up on you now no i'm just kidding but um but again and everybody out there thank you for listening so much we we both appreciate it and uh, as always i say at the end of every episode it's most importantly uh take care of yourselves out there <laughs>